Yeah. Can you hear me? Sure. Am I on? All right. I knew that was going to happen. Glad that's over. Um, thank you. All right, you can open your Bibles this morning to Psalm 23. I want to do three things this morning. I'm going to do three things this morning. Um, we're going to get an overview of the Psalms. That always helps to understand what we're reading, interpretation. And then I want to compare Psalm 23 with Psalm 22 and Psalm 24. We're going to do that because that is extremely interesting. Interesting to me. hope it's interesting to you. And then we're going to finish up with Psalm 23 proper and go through the verses. So let's read Psalm 23. We'll pray and then we'll dig in. As soon as I find Psalm 23. Okay. <clears throat> Here we are. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that's been done today, the, the studies and the fellowship and the music. Music is, is so wonderful to hear your people sing and glorify you. It's, it's just wonderful. We leave the world behind that has burdened us each, each week, and yet we, we come in here on Wednesdays and especially Sundays to, to worship and to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, to uh, admonish one another, to exhort one another, to comfort one another if need be. So we thank you for these times. We thank you for this psalm today. We pray that God the Holy Spirit would teach us, that he would illuminate our minds using spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, communicating to our hearts, and that we will be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, open up your Bibles, or if you don't, you your laptops, your phones, iPads, all that stuff, laptops. This is a beloved psalm, loved by all kinds of people, unbelievers as well as believers. Uh, I've been to funerals, and they use Psalm 23 and uh, do those. I don't believe that they understand it like we understand it or will understand it, but <clears throat> where do we get the name Psalms from? In case you're wondering, the Latin is liber psalmorum, liber psalmorum. The Hebrew word is sefer tehalim. Sefer tehalim means the book of praises. The book of praises. Psalms are praises. They're songs. The Greek is psalmoi, and that's where we get our term psalms from, from the Greek word. I like the Hebrew best, it just, it just rings, Sefer Tehalim, just kind of sings itself. <clears throat> it 
In the Hebrew Bible, there are three divisions. The first one is the Torah, which is the law, which is the first five books of the Bible. The Navi'im, the prophets, and that is Joshua, Judges, the Twelve, and all the major prophets. And then there's the writings, the Kethuvim, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Psalms is in the first part of the writings. So in Je Jesus, in Luke 24, 44, says, while I was with you, I told you everything about me. In the law of Moses, the books of the prophets, and the Psalms. And so what he's saying is, when you quote the first book, you're referencing the whole book. Because it's Psalms, the prophets, and the writings. <clears throat> so we're going to study the Psalms, and people throughout have been blessed by the Psalms. The Sefer Tehillim. Jesus at his last supper sang Psalms. <clears throat> they're Hallel Psalms and they're, and they're sung at the Passover. Psalm 113 to 118. The first three were sang, him and the apostles were sang before the dinner, and then after dinner, the last three. Now, in Psalm 118, remember Jesus is singing this with his apostles. Verses 21 through 24 of Psalm 118, he says, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected had become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. So I found that interesting. They would sing the Psalms, and he's singing this, knowing what he's going to do. He's going on his way to Gethsemane. And that's where he has his big doubt. Gethsemane means wine press, the Mount of Olives, where they would squeeze the olives in the press. <clears throat> and he went through a difficult time. What's unique about the Psalms it is that the Bible speaks down to us, if you will, with instruction, speaks down to us. It reveals God's thoughts for us. Does it now? It, it tells us what to do and why to obey. <clears throat> but the Psalms, in the Psalms, why they're so unique and so beloved is because we speak up to God. He teaches us how he wants us to talk to him. In a, in a sense, they are responses of believers to the, what the Lord God has spoken. And yet they are more than that. <clears throat> Athanasius. Ath you ever heard of Athanasius contra mundum? Athanasius against the world. It should be a bumper sticker or something. I'd have that. Athanasius was an early church father, a patristic, and he fought the Gnostics and contended, contended for the truth of God's word, the deity of Christ, and so on. He said this, the Psalms have a unique place in the Bible because most of Scripture speaks to us while the Psalms speak for us. Have you found that to be true? Not just a response from us, but it's an inspired, God-breathed response. These are the words God gave us to speak to him. Martin Luther, you ever heard of Martin Luther? Maybe once or twice. He said, as a teacher will compose letters of little speeches for his pupils to write to their parents, so this book he prepares both the language and the mood in which he should address the Heavenly Father. John Calvin, he said, I have grown accustomed to call this book the anatomy of the soul. He's talking about Psalms. 
There is not an emotion in which anyone can be conscious that has not here represented us as looking in a mirror. Or rather, the Holy Spirit is here drawn to the life of the griefs, the sorrows, the fears, the doubts, the hopes, the cares, perplexities, in short, all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men are wont to be agitated. The other parts of Scripture contain the commandments which God enjoined his servants to announce to us. The prophets lay open the most thoughts and affections. They call to the examination of themselves the many infirmities and vices the heart is brought into the light. I like that. The anatomy of the soul. So we think of the Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd. Verse 1. How many of us have cherished that phrase, I know that was my mom's favorite psalm. Cherish the concept, how much, how much comfort it has brought. And probably today, it's comforting people in, in Israel, I would imagine. Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who crowns you with loving kindness. And he satisfies your years with good things. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on us who fear him. In Psalm 56, 8, God remembers our sufferings. Put thou my tears into a bottle. God is intimately acquainted with your suffering. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firm in his handiwork day to day pours forth speech. And then later on, it talks about the world, how it re, the word, how it restores the soul. It makes wise the simple. It rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. It makes his words are sweeter than, than honeycomb. Psalm 19 is the largest chapter in the Bible about God's word and constantly talking about reviving us. Psalm 119, 9 and 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. Thy word I've treasured in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Robert Godfrey says, the Psalms do not, to be sure, make explicit reference to all occasions for which there are hallmark cards but they do mark all the important spiritual moments and emotions in the lives of God's people. He had a Latin term that he used that I like, semper in ora salmus, semper in corda Christus. Psalms always in the mouth, Christ always in my heart. I like that. Just a little bit more about the Psalms as an overview. It's poetry. There's poetry in the Psalms. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm here at church, and so are you. I made that up. <laughs> now that's, that's poetry, it rhymes. But Hebrew poetry isn't concerned with rhyming. It doesn't rhyme. It's, uh, there's a lot of metaphors, there's lots of imagery, and ex also expressed in parallelisms. Ever heard of that? Parallelisms. There's a couple that stand out, antithetical parallelisms. The Lord has blessed his godly ones, but the wicked he will do away with. That's antithetical. Positive, negative. Synonymous parallelisms. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. There's a couple of things. So the kinds of psalms. Sometimes over the psalms you'll see things like a maschil or a, or a mismore. There are wise sayings and songs of praise, just to name a couple. So what kind of psalms are there? There are praise psalms. Lament psalms, 
Psalms of repentance, like Psalm 32 and Psalm 38 and Psalm 51, of course. There are Thanksgiving Psalms. There are prophecy Psalms or Messianic Psalms. There are imprecatory Psalms. I've used a couple of those recently, this week. Those are interesting. There's temple hymns. There's Hallel songs, where the start and the finish of the psalms are hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. <clears throat> there are psalms of trust, and that's our psalm today. So moving, moving towards Psalm 23, let's see some aspects of Psalm 22, 23, and 24. But first, I want to read this. God really wants us to understand them. That's why he tells us to study. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. This is Jeremiah 9, 23. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, nor the mighty man boast in his strength. Or the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who exercises mercy, he exercises justice and righteousness, and I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Another way to know him is he's called the creator. He's called the bridegroom, a husband, a judge, a king, a physician, a maker, a father. Herman Baving points out that he's He's a lion. He's the sun, S-U-N. An eagle, a lamb, a light, a fire, a hiding place, a foundation, a shield, and so on. So, Psalm 23 is couched in between Psalm 22 and Psalm 24. I went to college for that. Six of my best years were in 12th grade. <clears throat> well, we see these Psalms. In Psalm 22, Jesus is shown to be the suffering king. Okay? He's the suffering king in Psalm 22. You might remember when he is on the cross, he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's the first verse of Psalm 22. He's the suffering king. Psalm 24, he's the sovereign king. Psalm 23, he's our shepherd king. Psalm 22 pictures the crucifixion of Christ for us. Psalm 24, he's the reigning king who is going to come back to earth. In Psalm 23, he's the faithful, dutiful shepherd. You could say Psalm 22 is a psalm with a cross. Psalm 23, the crook, you know, shepherd's death. Psalm 24, a psalm of the crown. Psalm 22, he's dying. Psalm 23, he's living. And Psalm 24, he is coming back. <clears throat> one, person, one person put it this way. In Psalm 22, the Lord is the good shepherd because he lays down his life for his sheep. Psalm 24, he's the chief shepherd who will come and call his own, right? In Psalm 23, he's the great shepherd leading, and guiding, and protecting. In Psalm 22, it's about justification because Christ died for you. He died for me. It's about justification. Psalm 24 is about glorification. The king is coming back and he reigns. And then Psalm 23 is about sanctification. Justification, 
sanctification, glorification. And we're going to see David was a shepherd and he was a sheep. Was he not? Just like Christ. Christ is our shepherd. But he was also the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. David is reminiscing in this Psalm 23 about how God has been faithful through his tumultuous life. If you think about his tumultuous life, the persecutions of Saul. Saul tried to pin him against the wall with spears from time to time. Chased him all over the place. How about the mocking of Machel? The betrayal of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was one of his advisors and ended up being a traitor with his son Absalom. The cursing of Shammai, the rebellion of Absalom, one of his sons trying to take his kingship. The machinations of Adonijah. Not to mention Goliath, Bathsheba, Uriah. All of these things is his tumultuous life, all the things that he's going through. But he had God's mind. He was a man after God's own heart, was he not? God says, I, look, I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. Look at the heart. When he faced Goliath, he knew his God it was with him when he was shepherding the sheep because he killed the bear, he killed the lion, he protected his sheep from that. Israel was standing there going, he's so big, we can't win. David said, he's so big, I can't miss. And we know the end of that story. I want you to understand, too, when we get into the psalm, this is a psalm from the viewpoint of the sheep. From the viewpoint of the sheep. Thinking back to what all God has done. All that God has done as the shepherd, how he tenderly led David, how his constant feeding of him, his caring for him. When he was running around from Absalom and Saul, people gave him food all the time. And we'll see that <clears throat> the first verse of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Just a couple of things about shepherd. The word sheep is used 176 times, lambs 164 times, shepherds 80 times. But by far, the most well-known is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh Rohi. From Ra'ah. Yahweh Rohi. David doesn't say, the Lord is our shepherd. He doesn't say, the Lord is a shepherd. He doesn't say, the Lord is your shepherd. There's a personableness to him. The Lord is my shepherd. The personal relationship. Actually, he is the one who's constantly shepherding me. And I shall not lack, if you look at your Bibles, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, want can mean different things today. I want this, I want that. Back then, um, it would mean lacking something. I shall not lack. And the rest of this psalm, Psalm 23, shows why he doesn't lack and why God is his shepherd. Joe Beakey says this, to acknowledge Jesus as our good shepherd amounts to be willing to lay down our lives, desires, our goals, our wants, and submit to the wisdom and guidance of the chief shepherd. I like Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world. It's the word soon schematizo, and it means to, to identify with outward, to, to, to follow a pattern. Don't follow the world's pattern, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's the word uh, metamorpho. We get the word metamorphosis from it. God is working a metamorphosis in our souls through his word, by the Holy Spirit, to walk with him, to worship him, and to be well-pleasing in his sight. <clears throat> Alan Ross uh, says this. He's got three great big volumes on Psalms. It's really good. David, using the setting of a pastor in a banquet hall... David meditates on several important ways the Lord provides for his spiritual and his physical well-being and concludes that this persistent, loyal love of God draws him to a full communion in the house of the Lord. <clears throat> so let's go through the psalm a little bit as we uh, think about God's provision for you is provision for me. The Lord is my shepherd. That is relationship. I shall not want. That's supply. He makes me to lie down. Refreshment. He restores my soul. Healing. Reviving. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. Guidance, his guiding hand. For his namesake, says the song. That's purpose. We've got relationships, supply, refreshment, reviving, right, guiding, purpose. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I fear no evil, protection. You are with me, David says. Faithfulness. Faithfulness of God. Your rod and your staff, he says, they comfort me. Protection. Guidance. Sometimes discipline. You prepare a table for me in the service of my enemies. That's hope. Gives us hope. You anoint my head with oil. Consecration. My cup overflows. Abundance. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Blessing. In Bible study class, we were studying Ephesians recently, and Paul uses every kind of verb and adverb and <clears throat> adjective the blessed God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then he lays them out all in chapter 1. In chapter verses 3 through 14 is all one verse. He's just spilling forth these great blessings of God. So we just saw relationships, supply, rest, hope, refreshment, healing, guidance, purpose, testing, hope, consecration, abundance, blessing. I mean, hallelujah. Do we need more? Just bask on that for a while. It's, it's amazing. Isaiah 40, verse 11 says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arm. He will carry them to his bosom and will gently lead those that have their young. What a great verse. What a great verse. He 
leads, he guides, provides, and he cherishes us. Now, just a little bit to talk about sheep. God considers us sheep, and it's not very flattering. This is me, and this is you. They're stubborn, dumb, defenseless. Sheep are absolutely defenseless. They're without a source of direction. Shoot, I get lost in Publix, you know. Especially when they change everything around. Hate that. They're prone to wander. I mean, that song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. Man, they're, they're slow to recognize danger. They're nervous, uneasy, easily excitable, and easily frightened. And that's why God tells us sheep. They can be in a grassy pasture and they can just wander off. They can just wander off and start eating junk. They're easily frightened. A rabbit can jump out of a bush or of a shadow and stampede the whole, the whole bunch. If they get stuck upside down, they can't right themselves. <laughs> they can't. They, ha they need so much help. We need so much help. This person put Psalm 23 this way. We can all relate to this, I think. The clock is my dictator. I shall not rest. It makes me to lie down only when exhausted. It leads me into deep depression. It hounds my soul. It leads me in circles of frenzy for activity's sake. And even though I run frantically from task to task, I will never get it done for my ideal is with me. Deadlines and need for approval, they drive me. They demand performance from me beyond my limits of schedule. They anoint my head with migraines. My in-basket overflows. Can you relate to that? Surely fatigue and time pressure shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the bonds of frustration forever. I can relate to that. Well, I'm retired now, but I used to. I saw a great meme the other day. I'm retired. I was tired yesterday, and I was tired tomorrow. This shepherd encompasses us. He's beneath me, green pastures. He's beside me, still waters. He is with me, my shepherd who shepherds me. He's before me, he prepares a table. He's around me in the midst of my enemies. He is upon me, the anointing. He anoints my head with oil. He is after me. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me. He's beyond me. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. He's before me. He's with me. And he's after me. Now, just as a shepherd, you can attach God's names. He's got a lot of names, but his personable names. Uh, verse 1 you can go Yahweh Yira, the Lord is my provider. You've probably heard it, Jehovah Jireh, that song. But it's Yahweh Yira, I like that one. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is my peace. He enables me to lie down in green pastures beside still waters. He's Yahweh Rafi, the Lord my healer, who restores my soul. 
is Yahweh Shema, the Lord is there. Even though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, he is there. You are with me. He is Yahweh Mekodesh, the Lord my sanctifier. Your rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He's Yahweh Kanum, the Lord of grace. My cup overflows. Well, let's look a little closer at Psalm <clears throat> 23. We can't think of a shepherd too long before we see Christ. Would you turn to John chapter 10? If you don't aren't able to turn there. If, if you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in front of you. But I'm just going to read this. Uh, or keep your finger in Psalm 23. I'm going to read verses 2 and 4, 11 and 12, and 14 and 16. John chapter 10. Jesus said this, The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him. And the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not a shepherd who owns the sheep. When he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and he scatters it. Again, he says, I am the good shepherd. And when he's saying I am, he's saying ego ami, which is the same as Yahweh in the Old Testament. Same as Yahweh. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. As the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, that's you and me, and others. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. We are part of the flock. First Peter 2.25 says, For you were straying. You were straying like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. He's the great shepherd of Hebrews 13, 20. Now I pray that the God of peace who brought you up from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. And we saw in John 10, he's the good shepherd. And 1 Peter 5, 4. And then the chief shepherd appears. You will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So he's the good shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. And the great shepherd. Okay, so going through these verses, Psalm 23. Verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Isaiah 48, 17 says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what's best for you who directs you in the way you should go. Verse 2, he leads me beside green pastures and beside still water. Sheep can't drink out of rushing waters. It has to be still waters. Or they'll drown. Or they won't drink. And then they'll suffer. Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> he leads me beside green pastures and still waters. He gives us peace. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, Take my yoke upon you 
Learn from me. I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 3 of Psalm 23, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. Now, the word for paths is magala, and it means, uh, you ever watch a Western movie where the the wagon train is uh, leaving divots in the road, ruts? Oh, that pathway word means to stay in the rut. Don't leave it. Keep traveling in the path of the rut. You go out of that, you're going to be all over the place. It's going to be a bumpy ride. But Romans 5.17 says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace, the free gift, of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus the Christ. I like what Paul says in Philippians 3 9, and be found in him. Paul says, I'm found in him, and you can say that I'm found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God on the basis of faith. There's three imputations. Adam's imputation on us, and we're fallen, we're born in sin. Our imputation on Christ, he bore our sins. And then Christ's imputation of his righteousness to us, where we stand before God without condemnation. Verse 4 of Psalm 23, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod was for... Uh, beasts, animals. Uh, the staff was for leading and guiding and sometimes yanking them out of trouble, things like that. But the shepherd was to give comfort. The shepherd was to give comfort. Second Corinthians 1 5, for just as the sufferings of Christ abound towards us, So through Christ, our comfort also. He doesn't leave you orphaned. He doesn't leave me orphaned. Jesus sends the comforter, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit to comfort and strengthen. Verse 4 again, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, dangerous things came out of the shadow. This, this psalm is also a psalm of living. It's not a psalm of dying. Although it can be used for dying, many people use it that way. It's a psalm of living. He walks through the valley of shadow of death. The sheep not only ate on mountaintops and hilltops, they had to go many times into the valleys. And there's shadows in the valleys. There's deep darkness, as the Hebrew says, in the valleys. Animals hid there. Bandits hid there. All kinds of Bad things in there. He says, Thou art with me. I won't fear. Just a couple more things. For the first half of Psalm 23, he's saying, He makes me to lie down, He restores my soul, He leads me beside still waters, He guides me in paths of righteousness. And then when you think about all that God has done for you, it naturally reverts to worship. Because then he switches to, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. That personal thing is, he's done all this, I worship you. You know, we're never so conscious of the presence of God as when we pass through life's valleys, right? Most growth is done in the Christian life in the valley. We don't really grow on mountaintops. You prepare a, you prepare a table for me in the midst of my enemies. 
Philip Keller said this. He's a pastor, but he was also a shepherd, and he wrote a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Philip Keller said, A good shepherd will prepare food by removing these three things. Physical hazards, because the sheep will run into them, destroying poisonous plants, and by driving predators away. That's how he goes before them. Plus, ancient shepherds used a mixture of olive oil, sulfur, and spices to protect their sheep from insects and promote and and fight skin diseases. In biblical imagery, oil and wine also speak of joy and prosperity. Plus, oil speaks of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So in finishing up, the last verse of Psalm 23, the 23rd Psalm pictures life as a pilgrimage. And in the final verse, the psalmist, right, the psalmist rightly comes to life's goal, which is the house of God. God's house, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You know, we mess things up from time to time, being sheep. But I like what this, uh, this thing here said. <clears throat> he came to my desk with a quivering lip. The lesson was done. Have you a new sheet for me, dear teacher? I've spoiled this one. I took a sheet all soiled and blotted and I gave him a new one all unspotted. Do better now, my child. I came to the throne with a trembling heart. The day was done. Have you a new day for me, dear master? I've spoiled this one. He took my day all soiled and blotted and gave me a new one all unspotted. And into my heart he cried, Do better now, my child. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet, and it is a light unto our path. It's alive and it's powerful. And I pray that you have used your word today for encouragement, for instruction in righteousness, for... uh, just the light, the light that you give us, it's it's always amazing. We stand in awe of it. So thank you for leading us and guiding us. Thank you for being our chief shepherd, our good shepherd, and our great shepherd. We'll think about this psalm from time to time. In Christ's name, amen.